all. Thank you for joining us today for our Frugal Science panel. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are tuning in from. Thank you for coming. I hope you were able to check out some of our great sessions, um, very engaging panels, talks, webinars that I have been enjoying these past few days. We want to see where you are joining from today, so feel free to put where you are from in the chat. It is very sad that today is the last day of opening week, but as we all know, all great things must come to an end. How it is going to work is I will give some brief introductions of the panelists and I'll ask a few broad questions just to help get the conversation started and get to know the panelists work a little bit more. After that, we'll get started with questions you have asked. The discussion relies primarily on the contributions of the audience. So feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A box and the chat area throughout the session. We will get to your questions in a few moments. My name is Shanti Hegde. I will be moderating this panel. I'm a After iGEM Communications Committee member. Our goal is to highlight the work of iGEMers and connect them with the iGEM community. We have visions of changing the synthetic biology world one PCR at a time. I'm joining you from Cumming, Georgia, United States from my home office. Today is about celebrating iGEM in a time where synthetic biology is growing faster than ever with a great power of synthetic biology changing the paradigm of biotechnology. There is no doubt we can develop new microorganisms capable of benefiting humankind. The scientific tools of bio biological engineering are what make it possible to engineer the microorganisms we are capable of developing. Additionally, frugal science has made it possible to rapidly advance our knowledge of natural components and networks that will allow us to better design optimal cells. What lies ahead? Through the works of the award-winning scientists we have on our panel today, we are able to work together in making low-cost tools accessible to iGEM teams, labs, scientists, and education systems globally. We are truly lucky to have these six award-winning guests with us today to share their story and how they hope their technology can revolutionize synthetic biology. First, we have Dr. Ali Huang, who is the BioBits lead at Mini PCR Bio, and previously got her PhD from MIT, where she co-developed BioBits. Hi, Dr. Huang. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Glad to talk to you all. Next, we have Dr. Saad Bamla, who he's here right now, who is a Georgia Tech assistant professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, where he runs a curiosity-driven lab. Previously, he worked with Dr. Manu Prakash at Stanford University. Dr. Bamla works towards promoting frugal science by mentoring a local high school iGEM team. Garav Gagathali is an undergraduate student at Georgia Tech studying industrial engineering and computer science and works along Dr. Bamla and frugal science. He's an iGEM alum and was with the Lambert High School iGEM team from 2016 until 2018. We have Soham Sinha, who is an undergraduate at Georgia Tech and works with Frugal Science alongside Dr. Bamla. He will be attending Stanford University in the fall. Soham works towards promoting Frugal Science by helping mentor a local high school iGEM team. Next, we have Dr. Jim Cybulski, the CEO of Foldscope Instruments and co-inventor of the Foldscope, amongst many other things in his history. Previously worked with Dr. Manu Prakash at Stanford University. Lastly, we have Bethan Wolfenden, the co-founder of Bento Bioworks, located in London. She is also an IGEM alumni who is with the 2012 University College London team. Thank you all for being on this panel today. So we are going to invite panelists to give a short introduction about how they are promoting frugal slash low cost science and accessibility through their innovations. So let's start with Dr. Ali Wang. Tell us about how Mini PCR is promoting low cost accessible science to the many products you and your team have created. Yeah, hi again, I'm Dr. Ali Huang. Um, oops, sorry, the poll results just popped up. Okay, yeah, I'm Dr. Ali Huan, and when I was a grad student at MIT, I co-developed BioBits, which is a platform for students or anyone really to be able to express proteins without the use of cell culture. Um, this is probably not gonna show up on webcam, um, but I have these little tubes here, and inside are all the BioBits pellets. So basically they contain everything you need for transcription and translation to happen and they're freeze dried so they could be transported and stored at ambient temperatures. You don't have to worry about cold storage. And the idea was to, you know, make this idea of having students be able to do molecular biology without the need of cell culture and the associated equipment. Uh, I currently work at Mini PCR Bio in uh, Massachusetts, um, Boston, Massachusetts. 
And uh, Mini PCR Bio, we can talk about it later, ha also has a lot of uh, different equipment and resources for frugal low cost science. So yeah, that's what we're all about. Thank you, Dr. Juan. Um, Dr. Bamla, can you tell us more about how your lab is promoting frugal science through the many innovations and inventions you and your lab members have worked on? Yes, well, thanks for uh, inviting uh, me and uh, some of our members to this panel. Um, in our lab, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, Lambert iGym uh, uh, in, in Georgia and Atlanta. And the way we look at this is uh, at iGym, typically it's the undergraduate teams that participate. However, there are high school uh, teams that a few of them also participate. And uh, with some of our work, essentially we think about high school science as very budget conscious uh, uh, laboratories. and how do we enable them to successfully participate in this iGEM competition? And our, our contribution working with the high schoolers, you'll hear a little bit more from Soham and Gaurav, is to help address some of these hardware uh, challenges uh, that enable uh, these high school teams to do synthetic biology. In the past, we, we've helped them build leverage 3D printing tools and unconventional materials to build centrifuges, electroporators, which allow them to build, uh, synthet conduct synthetic biology. And uh, we now have another, uh, a couple more uh, suite of hardwares that uh, we're helping uh, them build, so. Thank you, Dr. Bamla, for the insight on physical science. Gaurav, can you tell us about how you are promoting frugal science through the innovations and inventions you've worked on, such as the ElectroPen? Sure, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm actually a student in Dr. Palma's lab and previously I was on Lambert iGEM. And so during that time in the span of two years, we actually published two papers on a 3D printed centrifuge that costs about 50 cents and a 23 cent electroporator. And this was all within the context of working in a high school lab, having the limitations, especially as a member of a high school iGEM team. And so now we're taking that even further. Um, we're trying to see what exactly is possible. And I think one of the foundations of frugal science is we develop these innovations, but the ultimate goal is to spread it out into, into the world, whether that's through publications or media outlets, and allow other people to address the limitations of even our creations and iterate and develop them further. So we published the 3D printed centrifuge around a year and a half ago, and we've seen input from people testing it in Peru and all over the world um, and shown us use this 3D printing filament over the other one. Um, and they've given us so much input on how to improve. And I think that's really what we get out of um, Frugal Science is this idea of collaboration. And now we're trying to take it further, um, looking it into like the drug development space, drug delivery space, um, and addressing more health applications. Awesome. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, how having that be available, portable 20 cent pen size electroporator is incredible. How fascinating science can be. Soham, can you tell us about how you are promoting frugal science to the many innovations you have been working on or have worked on? Sure. Uh, thank you, Shanti, for the introduction. Um, so I'm a, I'm a current student at Dr. Saad Mamla's lab. And for like little bits of two projects I've been working on the past three years is that one, I've been working with uh, Gaurav and his iGEM team on developing ElectroPen. And two, a little bit more different from the synthetic biology part is I've been working on developing a low cost hearing aid. So to, in, in three years, we developed a 96 cent, uh, a low cost hearing aid for age related hearing loss. And one of the few things that I've learned that part of, part of frugal science is not just about creating tools, but creating accessibility options for those who may not have had the uh, infrastructure or the parts or the materials that are available to everyone as much as we take for granted in this um, in America and other Western countries. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Soham. Dr. Cybulski, can you tell us about how you are promoting frugal science to the many innovations you've been working on, such as the Foldscope? Yes, th thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Um, uh, so I uh, also was working in uh, Dr. Manu Prakash's lab and uh, together we uh, came up with this design for low cost microscopy. And um, part of our vision for that is um, that uh, it's not only a tool for, uh, for learning and for exploring the world around you, but also a platform for research and discovery uh, that can allow, um, you know, people to actually perform experiments 
um, with a very large group of people and over um, a very large and uh, diverse geographic region. And so, um, you know, Foldscope, um, we make it for less than $1 in parts, uh, but it allows you to see things as, as small as single cell bacteria. And um, so that, you know, there's, there's a huge array of opportunities that uh, it opens up in terms of um, different research questions that you can ask. Um, we also uh, like to think about, you know, lots of things, um, uh, accessories for microscopes and other low cost tools. And uh, we're working on uh, developing those such as a, um, a platform for doing microfluidics so that you can look at liquid specimens in high volume, and then you can use uh, an app with image recognition to help you identify what you're looking at. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarvolsky. Bethan, tell us about how Bento Bio is promoting low-cost accessible science through the many products you and your team have created. Um, so we started building Bento Lab, which is kind of an all-inclusive piece of equipment that contains um, everything for doing a PCR assay um, as the result of an iGEM project back in 2013. Um, and I think how we got involved in that was through DIY Bio, where people build their own equipment at home and teach themselves how to do molecular biology. And so for us, um, it was initially focused around how do you make the equipment more accessible? And since then, our ideas of what is accessible and what is frugal and how the two different have evolved um, and the equipment is currently used um, by researchers and citizen scientists, citizen scientists around the world and what's really interesting for us is the different kinds of challenges that they each face. Wow that's that's really amazing thank you Bethan. So, so um, I'll start with Dr. Hallie Huang. Um, what made you decide to start at Mini PCR and develop BioBit? Yeah, so, um, well, first, when I was, I developed BioBits when I was in grad school. So when I was, you know, deciding what labs to join, um, I came across uh, Dr. Jim Collins's lab, and they were working a lot on freeze-dried cell-free technology. This idea of being able to freeze-dry these biosensors onto paper and, you know, diagnose things um, different viruses, uh, they were working on Zika, Ebola, and being able to, um, you know, have a very low cost test that places that didn't have a lot of medical infrastructure or scientific inf infrastructure could use. And so I looked at the technology and thought, why not apply it to education? Because um, what got me really interested in science and biology was being able to do all the hands-on experiments myself. Um, you know, it's one thing to read about it in a textbook, but it's another thing to actually do the experiments yourself. And so I joined the lab and developed BioBits, which is again, this platform that allows people to learn about molecular biology, synthetic biology, without the need for cell culture. Because as we all know, uh, you know, shakers and incubators and all that fun stuff can be really expensive, take up a lot of room. Um, and then towards the end of my PhD, I joined up with Mini PCR Bio. Um, they make a lot of low cost accessible equipment. They make an accessible PCR machine, an accessible uh, uh, gel electrophoresis system, um, not just accessible in terms of cost, but also accessible as in very user friendly. So someone who had, doesn't have any science background um, can very easily learn how to use it and use all these molecular techniques. So uh, it was, it's been a great partnership so far. Um, we've launched our first official BioBits kit covering the central dogma and lots of students and teachers have already used it with lots of positive feedback. And yeah, it was just, it's, I just feel that we need to be able to give every student out there the opportunity to, you know, be exposed to science and discover their passion for it. And it's much easier to do that if we make all this equipment and all these resources more accessible. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Wayne. Dr. Bamla, so we have a question from Vijay G. What is the benefit of frugal science to common man today and the future? I think that's a pretty uh, bold question. I'm not sure I can uh, provide an answer that uh, encompasses uh, everything, but I can uh, perhaps uh, hint towards what allows, what keeps us going in terms of how it helps uh, the next generation of uh, synthetic biologists, especially at high schools and undergraduates. And I think uh, 
some of our work aligns with the original iGEM mission is to think about, is to train uh, next generation biologists to be able to not just understand programming in terms of uh, programming languages uh, and com computer science, but literally, you know, programming life uh, and think about, uh, you know, whether you have E. coli or any synthetic cell. And a key bottleneck uh, that comes into uh, play when you do this educational mission uh, and want to democratize this access to everybody across the world is hardware, because unlike programming uh, in a computer in, for synthetic biology, all of you are aware you require you know, infrastructure and tools. And the way we think about uh, addressing each of these for synthetic biology, you know, it might be as simple as pipettes uh, or, you know, uh, refrigeration or, uh, you know, hardware from centrifugation uh, is to help appreciate, all, uh, you know, synthetic biologists, especially those engineering uh, oriented, is with the same spirit of iGEM that allows these students to, you know, be bold and courageous and do synthetic biology, uh, be able to, you know, similarly not be stopped by lack of hardware, especially, uh, you know, students who might be in more budget uh, conscious areas. And that doesn't necessarily need to be in, you know, uh, uh, countries, whether in India or, uh, you know, Northern Africa or Middle East, but even in our backyards where we work with, you know, students from local Georgia. And so as we train students to use, you know, techniques such as 3D printing or, you know, whether you have uh, being able to prototype using plastic, but build your own tools and lower the barrier to entry so that they can successfully participate in this uh, bigger vision of iGEM. So that's where I think if you zoom out and think about it from 10 to 20 years from now, how this helps is that these students who want to participate and, you know, uh, champion the iGEM mission, Hardware shouldn't be a bottle. That's at least what we hope. Uh, similar to all your uh, prints about synthetic biology and primers and plasmids that are online, there will be CAD files that they need to be able to build their hardware uh, and print it such that they can use those to you know, continue on to bigger uh, things. And I think one, uh, one thing that helps appreciate this more than ever is the COVID-19 is where we notice supply chains break, break down and when you might not be able to buy things from Amazon, having the, having the flexibility to be able to build your own things is something we kind of, you know, all of us as a society have realized uh, in uh, very harsh conditions such as a pandemic. And so I think that's what is very empowering about thinking about frugal devices and low-cost hardware. Thank you, Dr. Balma. Um, our next question is, um, Sebastian asked this for Bethan. How exactly does Bento Lab work and how could it be used by iGEM team? Um, so it combines um, a centrifuge PCR, blue trans to with ge a gel unit. So, and if you're an iGEM student, then you're going to rapidly become familiar with how to use those bits of equipment. Um, and I think for us, it was something that we built as a result of leaving iGEM for the first time and wanting to have access to that equipment. And in some ways, building it all in one is a bit of a dumb idea, um, but it was this neat design concept because it meant that when people saw it for the first time, they kind of got what it was meant to be as in a lab. Um, so kind of the answer is yes. Um, although it depends on what you're going to be doing. What does your iGEM project focus on? Will you, you might also need things like electroporators and maybe cell culture, depending on what where your focus is going to be. Thank you, Bethan. So the next question is for Dr. Cybulski. Microfluidics sounds really interesting. How can we as undergraduate students implement this technology while keeping the cost minimal? Are there protocols or would we have to get in touch with an organization with spe which specializes in this tech? Um, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, microfluidics, um, I mean, uh, we're, for Foldscope, we're just starting to develop uh, some microfluidics platforms uh, now. So um, I'm hoping in the near future we'll have, um, you know, a platform that will help to enable uh, some experiments, um, you know, within microfluidics. 
Um, I think um, you know it depends a lot on uh, what what you're trying to um, achieve uh, with your system. Uh, in our case, um, we're uh, trying to um, introduce a sample, and um, you had mentioned about protocols. There's you know uh, protocols for staining and for um, you know preparing, diluting the sample um, in preparation for microscopy. I think there's um, you know I'm I'm not as uh, familiar with um, you know what what would be used. For example, for um, for other things such as um, with uh, PCR and uh, other experiments you might do, but um, you know it, it, um, we do a lot of our testing using um, materials that uh, we actually you know just source from from common things, um, just um, you know a basic uh, glass slide, and uh, we can build up um, microchannels using um, you know double-sided tape. And putting uh, plastic over them, uh, introducing the fluid, um, you know, into the channels, and then um, driving it using uh, positive pressure on one side or um, even a negative pressure from the other. So I think a lot can be done um, um, with some very simple systems, um, you know, just just from home. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish with the with the system. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sybolsky. Um, the next question, I don't think we have any more questions, so I'm just going to continue the discussion with some questions I'll ask. Um, the next question is for Gaurav. Since your 2019 PLOS Biology paper, ElectroPen, an ultra-low-cost, electricity-free, portable electroporator, what other research or research papers have you been working on? Yeah, so... Um... There's a lot of research that we do that I can't speak about yet because it's not public. Um, but a lot of the research we actually do now has translated into health applications, um, specifically in the context, ironically, of vaccine delivery and development. Um, that's one of the major needs in this time. And I think that is where we're currently translating um, our frugal science perspectives is um, I think during this pandemic, we've seen that there are clear bottlenecks in the development um, of therapeutics and drugs. Um, and as well as the development, there's a delay in being able to scale all these technologies. And so now we're trying to um, adapt these perspectives of frugal science into this industry to see um, how can we reduce the cost of things that are currently developed um, to respond to pandemics or um, to treat certain conditions. And also how do we inc make it more accessible and scale it very fast. Um, and we may have a research paper um, on it at the end of the year, but can't make no promises. There are always unexpected delays in research as we all know. Thank you, Gara, for that insight. Um, the next question is for Soham from PSB. How do you make frugal science attractive to entrepreneurs so that while it is frugal for the end users, it is still economically viable and potentially profitable to entrepreneurs to get into? Sure, I think uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Pretty tough one because we're kind of dealing with two opposite ends, right? So I think the, the feed that I like to put it in context of what we're doing now, something that my low cost sharing a locate, we, we currently have a product that we know that people can use, but the difficulty is like translating it. So I think it's a little bit more of combination of understanding what the exact product is and how you want to give it to the consumers. Because like uh, what I would say is that in order to make it profitable, it's kind of like saying that either we, you have to make the initial steps of it feasible or it have to be streamlined because it, most of the what frugal science tools that we have developed is that mostly for individuals to make it and try to make it into a streamlined factory production is a completely different uh, monster in my opinion. And that's something that we are dealing with with the locate and how do we transition from a two team member person doing these devices to a streamlined production. And I think that would be something better suited for Dr. Uh, Sibilski to answer because he has more experience with old scope instruments and how he can deal with that a little bit more better. So I would prefer Dr. Dr. Jim for that to answer a little bit better. Yeah, awesome. Dr. Sibilski, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, um, I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot involved in um, sort of taking a design um, into production and making it um, you know, work the same way it does um, with your original prototypes. And um, we've, we've seen a lot of that in, in the work that we've done until now. Um, you know, you use one method for fabrication when you're doing it by hand, but it's an entirely different 
uh, set of steps, you know, when you're making the actual uh, tool. Um, for example, with Foldscope, you know, we're using um, a laser cutter to actually cut out the parts, but then uh, for, um, you know, making the part in, in production, it's using die cutting. And so the, the sizes come out slightly differently. And uh, we had uh, some issues early on with that. And also just working with um, individual parts, like we have uh, ball lenses and, um, you know, getting the ball lenses uh, inserted into their holders and the apertures properly, making sure every aperture is, um, you know, fitting the size correctly. Um, there's, there's lots of challenges. And so you have to, uh, add, essentially add an additional layer, which is the quality control layer. And I think that that's, you know, there's a lot of work in that. And you also have to have um, partners that you can trust and that you can work with um, as you're scaling these things. So there's, uh, there's a lot of considerations in, in that domain. That's, that's my brief, brief answer. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Cybulski. Um, the next question is for you, Dr. Bama, by an anonymous attendee. In countries like India, where frugal science is especially necessary and beneficial, most of the population doesn't know about major breakthrough equipment like the paper centrifuge. Why do you think this is so, and how can we help promote it? Uh, I would actually respectfully disagree. I would say that, you know, uh, that's one of the advantages of uh, some of these low cost things that they actually are very attractive in the context like India. Uh, you know, we, uh, we shipped a few of the prototypes uh, when we first developed it to, uh, uh, to a few collaborators in different parts of India. And in fact, uh, I was surprised because, you know, information about these things travels through unconventional channel, channels like WhatsApp and other uh, things and uh, I I think that you know people are aware about uh, these things. In fact, I would even say that uh, there's a lot of uh, local students in different parts uh, working on some of these ideas pretty actively. In fact, there is some support from the Indian government. Uh, maybe Jim can add uh, some things because they uh, understand and appreciate from that local context that how important it is to nurture and support. Uh, low cost technologies because those are kind of the things that help scale um, to uh, to the uh, to the population numbers and uh, help uh, kids in uh, in rural places so I think it's actually uh, quite popular and a lot of uh, uh, attention both from uh, from the government as well as from universities and students they are thinking about it uh, uh, and in terms of how can we help promote it, I think we could, one thing that, uh, uh, that is really, uh, we, I would flip the question, I would say maybe we don't need to uh, perhaps even promote something that I might do at Georgia Tech, but if I flip it around, I would say, you know, I would be very excited to hear about some of the uh, tools that maybe a kid in India is developing. And so maybe it should be the uh, opposite is, I think uh, we could benefit more to see what some of these local grassroots innovations are coming out and see how do we enable them to merge them. I think there is still a sufficient bottleneck for some of these places to participate in iGEM because iGEM is typically in Boston and there is sufficient infrastructure and cost limitations for them to participate. And I believe iGEM is now moving to Paris uh, for the next couple of years, which will already you know, add a sufficient uh, uh, financial burden to participation. Um, any case, I think uh, there are different ways we could address that if that helps. Thank you, Dr. Bama. The next question is for Dr. Ali Huang. I'm so sorry if I've been pronouncing Shanti, it. sorry to interrupt, but I think mm -hmm. uh, I, I would benefit to hearing uh, either uh, Jim and some of the uh, Bento folks to kind of comment on this because I feel like mm -hmm. both of them have technologies and have worked in different parts of the world. It's always nice to hear, answer, hear about answers from different people on the same thing, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. Can you add on to that, Dr. Zabolski and Bethan? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, um, with Foldscope, you know, we've, we've been to, um, you know, quite, quite a few different regions now uh, doing uh, work with Foldscope. And one of the inspirations for me personally is just seeing, um, you know, um, sort of uh, how broad the awareness is, just to come back to Saad's uh, point that you know, we, we've uh, sort of um, started with, with an idea and uh, we've, we've tried to grow it. And really uh, we have distributors now in, um, you know, 
countries around the world that have come to us and you know approached us saying that they're they're excited about the tool and you know interested in uh, trying to bring it to their communities and and do workshops and get people excited about it so um so yeah we we have seen that you know i think there's always room for for getting more awareness out there and um sort of um you know encouraging people to use it in different ways and uh, think about different ideas but one other point that i'll make is um you know we um we've developed a factory for for making fold scopes and you know uh, over time uh, a variety of frugal science instruments but what we see our community uh, that is you know sort of a burgeoning global community um, as an idea factory and what i mean by that is you know we we created a tool to do something um, to do microscopy but what's what's the best application for that it, i think it's very dependent on context and there's so many ideas i can spend you know a lot large uh, amount of time here talking about them but there's so many ideas that have come from our community that we never would have thought of that's you know is really um really uh, coming from them so i think i think yeah the, the important thing is um just getting the idea out to the community and having some way to connect with them uh to get to get ideas back both in terms of their innovations but also their ideas for applications for your innovation um, and then in terms of, I guess, my comments to add, um, firstly, we have, India is actually one of the countries where we have the most inquiries coming from, um, and we have a distributor there. So I, I wouldn't, I'd agree that I wouldn't say that that's a place that there's not a lot of knowledge of that equipment. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is the focus on the equipment versus what the equipment can do. Because I'd say that, um, okay, with um, things like PCR or paper centrifuge, particularly with PCR, people know what PCR is in part thanks to COVID at the moment. I've had people contacting me saying, hey, isn't that the thing that you do? Um, but the challenge is more about like, what does the technology do? So you might have knowledge of a technology, but if you don't know how it serves your purposes or how it can be beneficial to you, then it's not relevant or interesting. Um, and I think that speaks a little bit to the idea of the previous question as well about why, you know, how do you make frugal science attractive to end users and entrepreneurs? Um, frugal science, we kind of have this question of, well, what is frugal science? And one, I think we're all assuming that it would be low cost, but there's, um, there's less value in something that is low cost if it doesn't serve the purpose that you want it to serve. Um, we, we've experimented with different price points, we've experimented with different ways in offering financing, and um, the, the key thing that it often comes back to is, well, does this do the thing that I need it to do? Um, and so I think that, that just speaks to both questions, is that um, it's, Frugal science is fantastic, but the question is more, does it address the need that the user has? Um, and does it provide them with something that feels like a meaningful experience that also fits within their budget? Thank you, Bethan, Dr. Cybulski, and Dr. Bamla. So going back to um, the same question about third world countries, will this enable third, third world countries to solve their problems th themselves? I would love to hear some insights from Dr. Bamla, Dr. Cybulski, and Bethan. Um, sorry, remind me what the question uh, is. Will it help uh, in, yeah. Will this enable third world countries to solve their problems themselves? Um, I, th I think so. For, uh, first of all, you know, the, uh, I don't know, it's not uh, super fair to say uh, third world countries, especially today, uh, seeing uh, our, our United States response to a uh, challenging situation. I don't think we are in any place to uh, throw any shade on anybody else. Uh, I think the way to think about some of these, you know, low cost approaches is, does it enable and empower somebody who has an idea to translate into something useful? And uh, effectively, that's what it is, right? Uh, everybody wants to be a problem solver and uh, by providing uh, means to translate that idea into something useful. And I, I see a theme 
popping up and I think perhaps we it's nice to kind of reinforce that a little bit. The theme is that all of these hardware and even in fact iGym's mission again is not to solve a particular disease or propose a particular model system is really to cre create a uh, universal standard and really the back backbone infrastructure so that people can identify what problem uh, is of interest to them but really keep that such that people don't have to keep reinventing the wheel in a way if somebody's made a plasmid then somebody else if it's documented and tested well enough and that is available then people should be able to use it and whether it is in a form such as a full scope that you could buy or a bento box you could buy or a design that's available with the CAD files the point is to kind of uh, make this accessible uh, to everybody, right? You don't want to be in a situation where uh, the bottleneck is that you don't know it's a black box and uh, ventilators, for example, were a key uh, problem. You don't want to have a key piece of technology that nobody knows how it works, how it builds. And if you have access to that information, I think uh, whether you're in, uh, you know, uh, Madagascar or whether you're in Georgia, Atlanta, uh, the internet uh, and cell phones are everywhere. Uh, lots of people have different types of hardware in different places, whether it's plastic, PDMS, a paper or 3D printing material. Um, and there's many different ways to be able to do it. Um, as with anything, there's a whole pipeline of bottlenecks and where hope is that we kind of address one at a time. So I think that's where it is. The key is to empower students for I think the context with biology is you can learn biology from a textbook, but it's a whole different ball game to do it hands on. And that's all of us are trying to do that is to say, okay, here's, you know, we saw one step, but we can't solve all of them, but enable the students to kind of build on our work. I think you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bamla. Um, we have Randy Retberg, who's the president of iGEM, who wants, who raises in, wants to talk. So, Randy. I don't know. I haven't tried this yet. Does anybody hear me? Okay. Yes. So, the the question of how do we uh, let me find the question again. Uh, how do we make frugal science attractive to entrepreneurs? So while it's frugal for the end users, still economically viable and profitable to entrepreneurs to get into. Uh, and what I wanted to do was point out the, the role of iGEM towards local people solving local problems everywhere in the world. Uh, what is that gonna look like? And the question is, are they going to go to Google Bio and then buy a, through Amazon Obio, uh, all their solutions, and it all gets shipped to them? Or can we make an industry that has different levels? I think about an example like plumbers. If I have a leak in my sink, I don't call Amazon and somebody comes out from California and fixes it. I call one of the many plumbers that live in my community, and I'm pretty happy. So. I think the question of entrepreneur might be something like this. Suppose we have a, a, a fold so, so, or, or suppose we have one of the electro pens, okay? Must that be a venture funded company in Silicon Valley with a possibility of a market cap of a billion dollars? Or in other words, kind of how rich does one have to be to be an entrepreneur? Suppose you live in India. Uh, and you're going to keep on living in India. And it's not such a fabulous, you know, you're not, not the richest person in India. And suppose that you can actually start up a business in India, making the electro pens and selling them to people in India with nice India, you know, the, with the right languages and the documents are all in the right thing. And you're only able to make, say, a million dollars a year. Is that attractive? There are probably people for whom an entrepreneurial activity worth a million dollars a year is a pretty good deal. Uh, the other side of it is that how few entrepreneurs do you need? Must it be a centralization of capital so that there's only one supplier of each of these different things? Or can we actually have lots and lots of suppliers and variety and change? Because 
in a lot of different kinds of industries. That's how the life, how, how life really works. And if we can do that, we'll find that all of these products get adapted to their local environment much more quickly than they will if it's done by a central organization. So my answer is to, to this question of, you know, can it be attractive to entrepreneurs? I kind of think that many of these things would be attractive to entrepreneurs uh, if we just lower the idea of how large an investment is appropriate. It may be that yes, you can in the most economically uh, optimal way, you can make something, you can make it in mass quantities, you can make it in Vietnam, you can ship by shipping container to each of the different places it's going to get it, and you now have made the one standard thing. But maybe this is a, a world where things can have greater variety and be made by a lot, you know, thousands and thousands of people. So it's a question of kind of the part of people think of the questions in economics like restaurants, you know, in lots of individuals making individual choices from lots of suppliers. But maybe the answer to the frugal bio is something where there's a lot of suppliers of a lot of things and many of them are similar or uh, all of that. So kind of a different, uh, moving the ball to a different part of the court. Can I add one point to that? Yeah, um, so I think I th one company that I think of immediately when I think of frugal science being attractive to entrepreneurs is Oxford Nanopore. Um, I think they've been immensely successful in reducing the cost of sequencing by like 50 or 100 fold. Um, and I think they've applied very similar principles to um, what we do, which is, it's not just about lowering the cost of the device. It's about making it equivalent to something that's already on the market. Um, it's commercial counterpart, for example. Um, I think we can say in that many of the papers that we have all published, we benchmark our technology to what is already out there to show that we're not just reducing the cost barrier. We're also matching um, the same performance to what is already out there. Um, and so I think I could say Oxford and Aeroport has like recently become an angel company in that it has a valuation of over a billion dollars. Um, so I think they're a successful company that's actually taking the initiative um, to make something that is low cost, more accessible, um, and at the same time, successful in the entrepreneurial world. I'd like to add one more thing about the entrepreneurs. There's a certain book called, um, it doesn't show up, sorry about the course, <laughs> but it's called Jugad Innovation. And it's, it's, it was written quite early in like 2010s and 2012. But they detail uh, several things about um, how innovation in India and especially in large these transnational corporations take on these, uh, these frugal engineering concepts and how they manage to translate it out into effective uh, products that are still on the market. And I feel like I'll, um, I'll just actually just type it out. It's called Jugad Innovation uh, by Navi Raju, Jaidi Prabhu, and Simon Ahuja. But the, I'm not sure how I can type it, but I think like this is a good book for anyone who's looking into like how to translate frugal engineering into a, a um, entrepreneurial system that works with already established companies. Thank you, Soham Garav and Randy and everyone. Um, does anyone else have anything else to add on to that? Yeah, um, I was hoping to um, add to Randy's point as well is that, I mean, we're talking about entrepreneurs and we're kind of talking about entrepreneurship as a, I want to make X million billion dollars here, but there's also social enterprise and social entrepreneurship and people who are looking to combine both. I want to build something that is profitable and is desirable um, financially with, I also want to have impact and do good on the world. Um, so an extra addition to that. And then there was a really interesting question in the comments about um, agricultural related aspects. Um, and there's a user that I follow on, in, on Twitter, uh, Laura Boykin, and she's doing um, something called the Cassifer Virus Project, where she's working in partnership with um, farmers locally in Uganda to teach them how to use min iron um, to analyze um, if they have a particular crop disease. Um, so I think that's that's a, a really interesting example of kind of frugal science from a, that meets a need and that is a local project and that I, I believe that people, there are local scientists as well contributing to that project and leading that project and setting like this is, this is the problem that we're trying to address. Um, so 
both as an answer to that question and a nice example of local um, local problems and local solutions. So, oh, is my am I if I'm still talking? Uh, there's one more thing that everybody should know about, and that is that iGEM is getting ready uh, in 2021 to start up a new level of participation, specifically a new league, specifically for teams who have fewer resources, are unable to travel to jamborees, uh, and need this frugal hardware uh, so that it will be less expensive to, for them to participate. And I'm hoping that we will end up with 10 times as many participants uh, in that league, which is kind of uh, a, a less resourced league, if you will. High schools might fall into that more often. We have a continuing problem of, of people who say it's too expensive to come to the Jamborees. Uh, and I, I believe that's true. Uh, and we might do something where we start to have kind of mini Jamborees in a whole lot of places, a lot more virtual Jamborees but a whole lot of new stuff. We're making so many changes in iGEM, uh, you know, this year by necessity and next year by choice. Move to the SDGs, the video, uh, uh, inviting a lot of other groups to participate with us. When we get to Paris, we have a quarter of a million square feet. Uh, if we're allowed to use it in 2019, uh, 20, uh, 21 rather, uh, who knows? But so we are trying to make a lot of change to be able to offer a frugal version of iGEM, if you will. So I just want to let everybody know about that. I think that's an awesome idea. I'm excited about it. I, I just had um, one comment I wanted to add to the uh, question that we were discussing. Just, so just to reiterate, um, the, I think the original question is, will this enable third world countries to solve their problems themselves? And uh, I just wanted to come back to the question because I think um, one important point is, you know, um, it depends on how we define the problems. Um, what, what is the problems that are trying to be solved? And um, in my mind, um, that's, that's really a, a, a big focus point because, um, you know, I think when, um, you know, from, from our perspective, if we look at their lives and sort of, you know, um, what's what's missing what's different from the way that we live our lives we might see the problems one way but they see the they might see the problems very differently and uh, to me that's um that's really um, getting at what's very central to frugal science is that we're trying to provide them with tools so that they can solve the problems as they see them right and we're not we're not providing uh we're, at least from my perspective we're not trying to provide a full solution we're trying uh, trying to provide a set of tools that then enables them to, you know, to learn uh, more about science, to uh, foster an interest, to generate data about the world around them. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, both, both from the uh, perspective of the tools uh, that we're making within Foldscope and, I mean, just generally the goals of iGEM and everyone else here, I really feel that that's, you know, um, a central part of, of what we're doing is giving them those tools and, and letting them define what some of those problems are so that they can solve them. So um, I really feel it's a strong yes. The, the answer to the question is yes, the, we, we are enabling them to solve the problems because they're, you know, we're giving them tools and we're, we're letting them define what the problems are. And so that's, to me, that's a big part of that, um, that equation. Thank you, Dr. Cybulski. Um, we are running out of time a little bit here, so um, I wanted to ask one last question to Dr. Huang. I'm so sorry if I've been mispronouncing your name. Um, the one last question is, how do you think that scientific tools MiniPCR has created, such as the MiniPCR Thermocycler and Molecular Glow Labs, will have an impact on synthetic biology globally in the next five to ten years? Yeah, that's a Great question, uh, and it kind of piggybacks on all the other responses that people have been telling this idea of using these tools and using these resources to empower people to learn about science, especially getting them interested in science when they're in middle school or when they're in high school. Um, maybe, like, especially if we're talking about some of these other countries or um, regions that maybe there is not that large of a focus on science and maybe these students 
um, normally with traditional equipment and materials may never be exposed to science at that age at all. But now with the advent of all these frugal, low cost equipment like our PCR uh, thermocycler, the BioBits platform, and all the other equipment that all the other panelists have talked about today, being able to bring these into these regions, these countries, expose the kids to this, and you know, make, show them that science is really fun, and it's not something that's you know a mysterious or a black box, and it's not something that's accessible. Um, just kind of showing them that this is something that is possible for them to do, and you know, the hope is that we inspires you know some of these students to get into science and then you know these students are going to grow up one day to be our like leading scientists and solve all the future problems so yeah that's where i kind of see like not just the next five to ten years but just you know beyond just getting as many students as possible interested in science um, not just in the u.s but around all around the world Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Huang. So unfortunately, we have run out of time here. So thank you so much to everyone that joined us in our conversation about frugal science, some amazing innovations that we have discussed today and how we can make them more accessible to adjunct teams like you all who joined us today. Hopefully it has given some of you inspiration to apply the philosophy of frugal science and help develop something innovative and learn more about the great works of these amazing award-winning scientists on our panel. Thank you again to our panelists who took the time off their busy schedules to be with us today. After iGEM, the After iGEM Communications Committee, and iGEM for making this possible. I hope all of you enjoy some of our last few sessions of the festival. Have a great day, evening, night, middle of the night to all of our viewers. Thanks for now. Take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. <laughs>